I guarantee in 100 million years, 50 million years, even 20 million years, there will be more biodiversity on the planet at a higher level of expression of beauty and intelligence than we have today. Mm -hmm. What is the species that is the jump from dinosaur to human? What is that same jump from human to what? What's up everybody? Taking a quick break from building the outdoor chicken run uh, to introduce our next guest. Today's guest is Dr. Zach Bush. I am so proud and honored to have been able to interview him. He is a physician and a leading expert in gut health, and he also studies its relationship to ecological health. After 17 years of working within the confines of Western medicine, Dr. Zach Bush was put on a path to let him back to microbes, the tiniest specks of life that could uncover enormous secrets to planetary health. Dr. Zach Bush is an expert in not only gut health, but he's a social worker and he runs a nonprofit called Farmers Footprint. What? Let's go! And they help to bring root cause solutions to human and planetary health. And he's an educator who's been transforming people's relationship to their bodies through his understanding of the microbiome. He certainly did it for me. So without further ado, Dr. Zach Bush. If you look at the world health data online and look at the rate of growth of our population, we have a, a birth rate and a death rate that is determining how many humans, therefore souls, are animated on the planet in any given moment. And when you look at those clocks right now, it's staggering to see the speed of turnover. And so minute by minute, we're having thousands of births and thousands of deaths. And those numbers are starting to become very close to each other. We're starting to plateau. But with that energy churning between life and death now in a bit of a balance, there's no longer this expectation that humans can just keep going in linear expansion as, as the NASDAQ would like us to do. We're plateauing, therefore economies are plateauing. They're, you know, We've built everything out of the belief that everything will be better if we consume more, if we suck mm -hmm. more out of the earth, we'll have more stuff. And if we have more stuff, then we must be doing better. We'll be more comfortable. We'll, we'll have more wealth. And we're starting to see the plateau of all of that. But we can heal and we can regenerate. And if it's one thing I've learned while I've been working with this piece of land, just when I think something's gone and dead, somehow it comes back. And that's the moment we're in as humans. This by the way, is the VIP section. <laughs> because I spent a good number of days in clubs around the world, living that old life of indulgence and accumulation in a lot of VIP sections, but <sighs> never one like this. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is true, truly the best. <laughs> this is where it feels like home. One of the cool things is that there is such a thing as motion, but not time, really. And we, we keep confusing time at, for the motion that defines our lives. And in so doing, we miss all the motion. And there's the motion of this river behind us that really sets the tempo that would allow us to be healthy, which is really a state, a word that means be aware of now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be unhealthy is to be unaware that you're here right now. And that lack of presence leads to this disease within us. And it can present in all sorts of manner. But I really believe that what you've achieved here already on this land in a short amount of time is an awareness of earth speed, as you call it. And that has changed the way you see everything, I imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, been, it's been a challenge, to be honest, um, especially when we're filming and doing these interviews, coordinating with everyone's schedule, and, and then putting it out into the world, and on some level still being influenced by that external necessity to grow fast or to scale, and to be relevant but through clicks and likes, as opposed to recognizing that just the state of doing it at a pace that is conducive to the health and well-being and self-care of each other and the community and nature and not worrying about the outcome 
or the result, but just being with it in the process has been challenging. You have to surrender all the metrics that anybody's ever given you to, to define yourself or your success. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge process. It's the biggest process. And ultimately, you know, that's, that's what everybody at the deathbed has to do, is to, whether they like their lives or not like their lives, they have to suddenly recalibrate their life. And they suddenly realize that everything they thought was important up until that moment probably wasn't important. The things they thought were maintenance and menial were important. And so that might be, you know, relationships and you know I certainly heard a lot about that I love being with my kids so, you know a lot of times I hear people tell the story at the deathbed of you know they remembered you know the birth of a first child or something like that but much more than that you know the stories that are riveting are the ones where they remembered an instant in time that captured the whole essence of life and that might have been them when they remember their first time they got to drink a cup of coffee with their grandmother because uh, you're a grandkid you're growing up you don't really you're not aware of your grandmother when you get to be an adult and you develop a relationship to coffee and it becomes a ritual in your life and then suddenly you find yourself for the first time at your grandmother's table sharing a cup of coffee and suddenly ancestral lines are connected in your awareness over a ritual of a bean that's been roasted in a far-off jungle and is now transported to your table and the aroma and the sense of, of motion of the steam coming off the coffee suddenly takes over, usurps some momentaries before when you thought time was the motion you were concerned about. And in that indelible moment of coffee with grandmother, you got to see the whole of life. And you didn't realize it at that moment, maybe, but at the deathbed, you realize it. You realize we really are just whipping by any, everything that's important, everything that's real. I guess that's how I would define important is what is real. Hmm. And the only thing that's real is this second. And so we are right now doing the only real thing on the planet as we are looking at each other. And there's no technology that separates me from you and the beauty of your eyes. You have these incredible eyes that are riveting, not just for their, their own color, but in the context in which they occur, which is the dark lashes around your eyes and the, and the strong brow and the salt and pepper and the beard and the smile and the creases of your smile lines around the eyes. And that's beautiful. I'm looking at you as if your grandmother could see through my eyes and say, that's my grandchild. That, mm. that is a being that carries everything that I ever wanted to give the world is in that face of my grandson. That face that I get to witness right now in the sun coming through the trees and everything else, that is real. Everything else that I can possibly set my mind to is no longer real or hasn't become real yet. <laughs> and yet I focus so much of my attention out there and so I fail to see the beauty in another human. Mm -hmm. And so I fail to see the beauty in myself. Flattery will get you all the life. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes. Feed me. Yes. It's the, you know, the, the compost of my soul is to, to, to be seen. We need to be acknowledged. We need to be given place when we invite people here. It's like, how can we not only give nutrients and, you know, to the soil or amendments to the garden, but also to human beings? Like, how do we really nourish them so that they come alive and they feel like they can actually be here fully. Our community is so distracted, we're distracted from ourselves and the world that we don't feel like we belong. We don't feel like we are um, invited into uh, our community because we're going ignored or unseen. I certainly had that narrative in my own head for decades and decades. And it was just in these last couple of years where I found out with horror is that the reason I was unseen wasn't because I was different than everybody around me and was thinking different or doing It's because I couldn't see myself. Mm -hmm. So the unseeingness that I was feeling was that I couldn't see my own beauty, my own soul, my own purpose, my own journey was invisible to me because I was so busy externalizing my self-identity and my sense of purpose and my sense of value it was all external. And that's what leads to that skin crawling anxiety within us, that skin crawling anxiety that then 
oftentimes decays into just numb depression. And we've so, all of us have experienced some version of it. Yeah. And in the end we find out it's because you are not taking the time to put that arrow in and look inward to find that self. That is just inherently a beautiful vibration. There's a tone within you that is you. And that tone literally sets up the biologic reaction. So it's, it, when you say a tone, it's a vibration, which means it's a physics event. It, it happens in the vibrational field of the electromagnetic field and the vacuum and all this. But that wave, that tone that is Zach, has been animating a biologic organism that's extremely, beautifully, miraculously complex. 70 trillion human cells with 14 quadrillion mitochondria liberating the energy of the sun into my body so that I can re-manifest this body every millionth of a second at the quantum level. I am a regenerative biophysical event mm. that yeah. felt inadequate, felt like I had to define myself as you know, something. And so triple board certified had a lot to do with my own insecurity of knowing this. Yeah. I needed to know more. I needed to figure out my sick patients because I was responsible for them. My God, if I was responsible for life, it would have never occurred. I'm a human brain. I'm, I'm too small. I, I'm too reductionist in my sense of awareness because I'm not a human being. If I'm not present and really in that space of stillness, then I'm just a human mind with, with the split belief that I'm separate from everything, therefore I live in a world of scarcity and therefore I need the ego to grab onto to protect me. Because it's terrifying to be separate mm -hmm. from everything. You're alone. Mm -hmm. And if that's really your condition, you, you desperately need your ego. And you reach for brilliant tools like alcohol and drugs and Instagram or whatever your drug of choice is today. These are brilliant survival tools to get you far enough down the road to realize that you're none of those things and that you're just you and you are an original tone. Mm -hmm. And if you let that tone become your dominant source of awareness or source of inspiration, then all success comes rushing in because it's on a different metric. The metric of your success is now your own metric. So what makes you feel valuable in the day? Mm -hmm. is sitting by your river? Is it you know, feeding your llamas in the morning? Is it sitting and watching the, the, the blue bonnets fade away and your, your orange Texas wildflower summers take off here with every thousand different species of orange? I love Cal California for the same reason. That orange is this dominant color of summer. Yeah, I, I'm in Virginia where green becomes the, the dominant, you know, dense color of summer. But in these plain states, we get these incredible bursts of oranges that tank over in the, in the heat of summer. Maybe that's your metric for success, you know, is did I notice the orange summer? And did I see those flowers this year? So I'm excited by what you're doing here because this is probably uh, 4,000th farm I've stepped foot on in the last six years as we've started to march into this intersection between human health and soil health. Like my text messages all day long were pictures of people harvesting their berries today. Or, you know, people always want to send me their pictures of <laughs> how they're interacting with their nature and what, what co-creation they're working today. And that puts me in this state of bliss of just like, whew, humans are starting to be. Yeah. And this is our transition point. This is, this is the miracle that is unfolding. A miracle is not, not a rare event. A miracle is the moment that you choose something different. Mm -hmm. And today we are starting to choose something different than the development next door. For 40,000 years they'd figured out that nature was a provision of an imagination. And nature's imagination was the thing that would always be present with them. And it would always be more abundant and more biodiverse and more adaptive than before because that's how it had been for four billion years. And they came to trust that. And so somewhere in our march from natural law to divine law, we lost it. We started it's to believe law. our God was separate from nature right. and therefore usurped our understandings of natural law, which basically stated all living things are sacred and therefore no, nothing can be abused or extracted. It all is sacred, it needs to be reverenced. That we are nature. 
if we can learn through biomimicry or through witnessing nature, witnessing us, we can actually model our behavior with the same diversity and complexity, which will lead to health. Yeah. It's spot on, and that's actually where I spend all my time every day in now is about 12 years ago I left the university and started my own company for the first time, and that matured into uh, a innovation hub that we launched in 2014. And so for the last eight years we've been running this innovation hub that looks at the systems that are most threatening the planet, therefore the systems that have the greatest opportunity for reinvention and Co, you know, co-creation with nature in that biomimicry form. And so we tackled health and um, developed a series of extracts from fossil soils that allowed us to understand the microbiome's role in human health. And this was a revolution for me and every scientist that's worked in my labs now has just been mind-blowing because every, every scientific experiment we had done in the, in the cumulative 150 years of scientific experience in those individuals in the lab had been done in sterile petri dishes that were isolated human cells. And so we came to understand human biology as an isolated event, and mm -hmm. therefore we screwed it all up. We have the backwards belief of cardiovascular disease, the number one killer of humans. We have the absolutely upside down version of cancer. We have a completely upside down concept about the immune system or autoimmune disease. And so over and over, because we studied it in isolation as a human event, we failed to understand that it was about community. Mm. And so what you guys are doing here is what we've gotten to experience in petri dishes. When you add back the intelligence of the microbiome to human systems, it explodes with healing. Those human cells start healing so fast that it doesn't make sense. Like we don't have biologic understandings of how regeneration happens that fast. It's as if it's coming out of vacuum space in real time. It's like it just emerges and it's like here's human life because it has been informed by the community in which it has developed and originally. And so, I, I, I'm just getting flashes of like, uh, you know, I've, I've done some, you know, criminal justice work and just imagining taking, taking people, putting them in isolation or putting them together yes. with the other criminals out of community or homeless people. You take them and, you know, put them away or t take them outside of community. How about a kindergarten class? How about an, an elder community now called the nursing home? Mm -hmm. Yes. We have created monoculture all over the place. Wow. We've created isolated petri dishes of existence. Mm -hmm. And therefore we've all lost track of community, what it means to be a natural being, what it means to be within nature. We don't even get it. We don't even ask the question <laughs> yeah. until a crisis happens. I'd been groomed through 17 years of medical training and postdoctoral work and everything else and had a quarter million dollars in school debt. And, but I was being told by the community that I had chosen to, to identify myself with in Western medicine that I was the man and I was yeah. on the trajectory and I was doing the thing and I was going to be the dean of medicine someday at the, some great Ivy League university and blah, blah, blah. And so I went through those 17 years of I entered the 17 years very altruistically. I wanted to help people and I, I decided to go into medicine not because I, it was obvious. I, I was not a very good student. I was mostly spent my time under cars. I was an auto mechanic and I was you know, a landscaper, a contractor. I, I, did, I was always working with my hands in the dirt, digging holes and messing with cars and all that. And so it wasn't until I went and did some work in the Philippines and had an opportunity to work with an international group of midwives and saw birth that it just like shattered my previous thought of where I was going. And when I saw birth happen and found out you could have a career that was around the emergence of life from a woman. I was like, that's, that's the most amazing thing I can imagine. And so I was like, all right, not going into engineering, I'm gonna go do this thing. But I wasn't a good student, so I was like, I'll be a nurse. And then I started down that path, and suddenly in the early 1990s, there was this opportunity to be a nurse practitioner, which kind of was sort of like a doctor, you know, is how it was pitched to me. Uh, and so I kind of went down that route, started pre-med to get ready for that, and then the physician assistant career emerged at that moment. They were more into surgery and doing stuff with their hands. So I was like, oh, that must be me, because I'm... So I started going down that path, and I was down in a deep mud hole of a sprinkler main that had blown on a little property I was helping take care of. And me and my best buddy at the time were 
just covered head to toe in mud after six hours of digging this giant mud hole, trying to repair the sprinkler main. And he was a paramedic. And we're talking through, you know, everything under the sun as you do when you're doing physical labor. Finally got to like career stuff. And he's like, you know, I was telling him, I wouldn't be a physician assistant now. And he's like, I work with docs all the time. Like they have so much freedom as to what they should go. You should just be a doc. Like it's just another year or two of school. And Turns out he had no idea what he was talking about, you know, and, and I had no idea. And so I was like, oh, an extra year or two, I could do that. And so that was how clueless I was to enter a path. And then the world saw that opportunity and it, and it put me on a 17 year journey away from myself. Because mm -hmm. I was a pretty real kid at the time. I was just, I didn't have any lofty goals. I didn't, I was a real kid that just wanted to like make a way in the world. And I was very happy working under cars. I didn't need to do anything glamorous and I was finding great happiness and success at that time of my life. It was one of the happiest, you know, times of my life. And then suddenly academia sucked me in and said, oh, you're, you're, you're going to be lofty in the future. You're not valuable now, but we're going to make you valuable mm. if you'll just keep doing what we show you to do. And, and so then I just got separated from myself and I lost myself down that path. And by 2010, I was, you know, doing cancer research and chemotherapy development and didn't know who I was. And it was a patient that rocked my world. And um, she was the first patient admitted to my cl first clinical trial that I had gotten approved for this n new vitamin A drug that I had created for as an adjuvant to cancer. And we were sitting at the, in the clinical research center at, late at night, it was like 9.30 where, when she got admitted. And I was sitting there and, and you can imagine my excitement, I was about to have my first patient enrolled in this novel you know, drug therapy. and. I was gonna change the face of cancer and blah, blah, blah. Like I had a heady moment. And so I'm sitting there in the dark and feeling all pleased with myself. And the research nurse comes in to deliver the first four capsules that are supposed to be swallowed by this patient. And both to my surprise and the patient's surprise, this woman is gowned up like she's like in a hazmat suit, like carrying these four pills out in front of her in this gloved hand and hands them to the patient and said, just swallow these with this cup of water. And, and the patient, understandably, is looking at her like, are you insane? Like, you're just scared of touching it or breathing and I'm supposed to swallow it? Like, wh what's in it? And I'm just as shocked because the thing is completely benign. It's a vitamin A com compound. And yet the clinical protocol for right. investigational drugs assumes it's a horrible poison. And so the nurse in the clinical protocol comes in this hazmat suit, basically, to deliver these four capsules. So then over the next 45 minutes, I had to convince this woman to swallow those four pills. And I had to overcome all the fear that had just been induced and the lack of trust that suddenly existed between the two of us. And I couldn't overcome that. I couldn't imbue trust. And so I defaulted to fear. And I developed a narrative of, to scare the shit out of her that she would Oof. die of her cancer unless she swallowed those four capsules. And that's the training I had gotten, was how to use fear to induce a behavior, to make somebody do something that is against their intuitive knowingness. Because by that time she told me, I am not supposed to swallow these pills. My body is telling me not to swallow these pills. Mm. And I finally broke that will. And she swallowed those four pills. And that was the end of me being a doctor in so many ways. And so what was the crisis that happened to me to start me on another thing is when I found out I was capable of breaking another human being with the altruistic patina of health. Oh, it's becoming more apparent that that relationship between us, the general public, and the authority of, well, those in supposed authority. I just had a flashback almost. Was it? It you was know, the biggest fear narrative that's ever been created in human history. Yeah. A single narrative to 7.8 billion people. Right. And it reached them all in a matter of weeks. To break us into submission. To make us do something that we intuitively knew at our gut level mm -hmm. was not right which was number one to isolate. Mm -hmm. We intuitively know that when the shit hits the fan, we need to come together in community. And yet we were so paralyzed by a fear thing that we did exactly the opposite because we were broken by the fear. Mm -hmm. And then we did a my myriad of other interventions that have been extremely polarizing in the human experience because it's this ultimate battle between our knowingness and fear and what is gonna win out. And ultimately, we're all giving in to some version of fear right now. Even those that are against the common narrative are joining together about a fear narrative over the common narrative. And that's no different. 
So let's let's not go there. <laughs> let's come back to health and its relationship to our inherent nature mm. and our microbiome. First of all, what is a microbiome for those who don't know what that is? It's what you're seeing and looking at around us in the macro form. So we're looking at this diversity around us, the birds going, the trees and the sunlight. A microbiome, the word micro, is simply the description of a, a almost invisible community of biodiversity. And to give you a sense of scale, around us right now, we probably have a couple hundred species at most represented in the macro realm around us that we can lay eyes on. In contrast to those couple hundred, in my gut right now, I have 40,000 species of bacteria that should be represented there. 40,000 species is much different than 100 species, especially in their, their collective intelligence. Because we find that as you diversify a small ecosystem, you get a higher and higher level of intelligence, which at the, at the physics level, the fabric of everything is called syntropy. You get a higher levels of order or syntropic behavior of that microcosm there as it becomes more diverse. It literally up levels its intelligence. That's what the microbiome has done to allow life to occur on the planet. And it was a long run. You know, the first bacteria were about four billion years ago. About three and a half billion years ago, we get viruses which allowed for genetic communication to speed up biodiversification, adaptation, therefore the diversification of species. And so with the advent of, of viruses as a communication network, we sped up life on Earth and its possibilities. Billions of years go by and we start to see, by two and a half billion years ago, multicellular structures in the fungi and then plants, ultimately, and then animals. Uh, first, you know, single-celled sea creatures emerging as multicellular things. And soon, after billions of years, we have this biodiverse system that at every moment was happening because of this invisible microbiome that was diversifying, diversifying, mm -hmm. diversifying. And each niche of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, parasite that was developed in that, that grand community, that global community of microscopic creatures led to this higher order of syntropy, allowing higher and higher orders of intelligence to emerge at the level of matter and physical manifestation of life. I mean, they, they say it's survival of the fittest, but really it's survival of the most collaborative. That's exactly right. Yeah. It was never survival of the fittest. You know, it, we would have created monocultures immediately. The strongest species would have taken out. And that's how life started was the strongest species. It was this, these little bacteria, these called archaea, that could exist in acidic pools at the foot of volcanoes, like <laughs> the most toxic stews on everything, and they could survive that. They were the toughest suckers on the planet. They were the fittest creatures that still exist today. They are the most resilient to radiation. They're most resilient to acids. They're most resilient. And they didn't take over the world because the plan wasn't to be the fittest, the strongest, the most resilient. The plan was to create beauty mm. and to get beauty as, a, as an expression of the fabric of nature which is energy yeah. uh, the, the energy that creates the solar systems and the galaxies and, and something like a syntropic universe where we see the organization of higher and higher level orders of intelligence and expression always was in the, in the form of possibility our curiosity as humans is the closest we come to God because it is our, de our demonstration of our understanding of possibility. If you have a curious moment, you just had the, not just the thought, you had the sensation that something new could be created. And that's what nature has been feeling on mm -hmm. this planet for four billion years, is the sensation of more possibility. And it does not stop doing that when extinctions occur. And so here we are in the sixth great extinction and we can create great hope because the last great extinction 60 million years ago when that asteroid hit the planet, it covered the whole earth in this layer of dust that choked out all of the microbiome of soils and everything else and we acidified the oceans due to the gases that were off foot and everything else. But instead of struggling back over the following 55 million years to recreate the ferns and dinosaurs, nature felt more possibility and so she went and created deciduous trees, wildflowers, mammals, birds. That's an amazing response to a cataclysmic event. 
Instead of being downtrodden and disappointed that, oh man, it took us four billion years to get to the level of dinosaurs. It was like cracking the knuckles of like, all right, what next? It was like, let's, <laughs> let's get this game really on now because when we put that planet under stress, every species made an enormous amount of viral data. Yeah. Viruses are, are new potential opportunities. And so when you put a planet under extinction level stress, there's so much new opportunity mm -hmm. that nature creates out of that in the form of viruses, in the form of intelligent new genetic codes. And so the earth exploded with biodiversity after the last extinction. So we can be human centric in our understanding of the sixth extinction that we have engineered. We are the cataclysmic event on the planet, but we can also be very human in our, our temptation to make it dramatic about us <laughs> or make it dramatic about the end of everything. I guarantee in hundred million years, 50 million years, even 20 million years, there will be more biodiversity on the planet at a higher level of expression of beauty and intelligence than we have today. Mm -hmm. What is the species that is the jump from dinosaur to human? What is that same jump from human to what? Mm -hmm. What kind of intelligence is gonna emerge from this higher order of expression as biodiversity takes on a whole new level of possibility in these centuries, millennia, and eons to come? And the selfish part of me is wants to stay in play. Like it's, I, I want to see that. I want to see what is potential. I, I mean, I think you can. I, I feel like I we become seeds and we get to create the information that is contained within those seeds by playing with our epigenetics and how we be, how we, what we embody. And that is encoded within our DNA and that will be passed down into future generations. So your expression will reemerge one day, I think. I believe you're right. And I think we're getting to see it. Like that's why I love my life so much is being on regen farms all the time. I'm looking out through these trees right now up this path and the path is made from disruption of tire tracks or something like that, or some sort of human intervention that drove, drove these, these like dead patches, you could call them of, of earth, but I know I'm looking at just sheer potential right there because the injury that's been induced by the repetitive motion of a tire across soil is the thing that begins life anew. The disruption. It's yeah. the disruption that yeah. creates the new opportunity. And so when we look at the path there or the much higher level of disorder and dysfunction in, in a development next door with bulldozers, we can get excited that both of those represent an injury that is going to call nature into action for a higher level of intelligence, which might take beyond our lifetimes to see, but it will happen. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we are seeing in our children right now that are being born a different way of seeing themselves back into nature. But it takes some discipline as parents and as you know the, the construct of society right now, those that dictate power right now, it's going to take some discipline to give those children enough space to imagine the future we would all like. Mm -hmm. Because right now we are dictating to them a future that is so full of distraction, so full of disconnect and artificial connection that we, we you know, risk failing to make that leap into that seed-like possibility that you're feeling beneath your feet on this farm. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, do you want to come check out my soil and see how the garden is doing and pick ourselves some dinner? That's exactly what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> You can see mycorrhizae starting to come up in this the soil. Um, and so you, as you get more and more architecture in here, your, your plants will taste different because you have more diversity of mineral salts inside the, the plant life itself. And uh, that's just a function of microbiome ultimately. Over and over again, we keep coming across the many, many heads of the same monster, the myth of separation. And it's shaped all of our human history and has made us think that we can somehow view ourselves as distinct from nature, separate from. Before we even begin to create shifts in our habits and what we do, we must first tilt our head to the side or upside down or inside out and allow ourselves to see things anew. Every solution takes us back to the truth of interconnection, the big picture view that shows us 
that we owe our existence to a teaspoon of healthy soil that is soaking in rainwater and basking in the sun. So let's nourish the soil together, and in turn, I promise you, it will nourish us. <laughs>